Uh-oh, you're all looking. Not you. What? You're all wearing jerseys of some sort. So, let's see. What kind of jerseys do we have here? We've got some... Uh, We've got what? New jerseys. <laughs> well, we got some old jerseys too. <laughs> These uh, kind of identify us a little bit, don't they? Like what we like are, are, are the teams we root for. Um, I see a lot of Patriot jerseys, some Bruins jerseys, some other jerseys. What would I say if for to, well, okay, what are some identity markers for being a Christian? Uh, do you have to wear a Patriots jersey? Okay, what about, I like sumo, so do you have to watch sumo wrestling? No. What about wearing a hat in the sanctuary? Or what clothing is inappropriate? What about eating lobster or pork or blood tofu? Well, enough about identity markers. We'll get to those in a minute. I have a friend who struggles with alcoholism. At one point, he decided to lose some weight, or as he told me, I want to get rid of my beer belly. And so he lives in the flat country, and he started running the, running the, the rural lanes of Illinois, and he began to feel better, so he began to run more and more each day. Soon he lost enough weight that um, he began feeling really healthy, but he became obsessed with running. He became obsessed with what he put into his body, uh, alcohol being the exception, and two and a half years later, we could hardly recognize the guy, and his wife told us that, well, I think he has replaced one addiction with another addiction. I remember we had breakfast together, and he allowed himself to eat a bacon, egg, and cheese, ba or bacon, egg, and cheese bagel, and he says, you know, I feel like I'm sinning. Sometimes the things that seem good at first glance later prove to be another form of enslavement. So today, today's passage is talking about identity markers and enslavement, and those are two contemporary examples about what Paul is addressing in today's passage. We're looking at the book of Colossians. We're just simply going verse by verse through the book of Colossians. And from a pastor's perspective, let me say it's interesting to go through a book because some, sometimes you hit a passage that you go, woohoo! Another passage you go, really, Lord? You want me to? Okay, I guess I will. And uh, um, I believe the Holy Spirit wants us to go through the book of Colossians. And one of the reasons is we get to see how Paul instructs them to deal with the non-Christians in their community and uh, how, how Paul is instructing them to deal with the, their marketplace. And we're pulling out and we're taking a few minutes to look at our marketplace and how to talk to people in our community. Last week, Paul encouraged the people at Colossae to stand firm, rooting their lives in Christ. And that is the best response to dealing with demonic philosophies and the worldviews that are out there is to stand firm in Christ. Today, Paul counters some of the main points of this philosophy slash religion that is all mixed up. It take, took the best of paganism, Judaism, and Christianity, and it, it made it sound like a wonderful, wonderful thing, like losing weight. Now, Paul's principles for dealing with this philosophy uh, today is a lot like Pastor Kevin's sermon in the fall about scruples. And uh, Paul addresses both the freedom and boundaries we have in Christ. Today we're looking at the freedom we have in Christ, and he starts by addressing the rule followers, those who, who, who play by the rules, who enslave themselves and uh, are good people. Well, let's jump in, Second, uh, Colossians 2, verse Colossians chapter 2, verse 16. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or the Sabbath. These are shadow, a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions, puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind, 
and not holding fast to the head, from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grow with, grows with a growth that is from God. So this philosophy mixed in Judaism, and here's just some elements of Judaism here. There are food laws, strong drink or wine, and Jewish holidays on the calendar. Now, rules sound good, but they're really mo nothing more than man-made ideas. They're false identity markers. Now, our Pentecostal heritage has some really fun identity markers. For example, and they were silly, when I was a child, I was not allowed to go roller skating. Because roller skating was, well, pretty close to dancing. Roller skating was also in a place where they, eh, well, there's loud music and there's, you know, alcohol served there. Now, it was, too, it was just, it was, I was not allowed to go roller skating. And the fact that it was okay for me to strap on wheels onto my shoes in the basement and roll around downstairs, that meant that there's nothing wrong with roller skating in and of itself. They were talking about the environment. But the point is, promoting things like this really seems good on the surface, but it's enslaving. Like my friend replacing one thing, one addiction for another. Now, let me give you verse 17 in another translation. For these rules are only shadows of the reality yet to come. And Christ himself is that reality. In other words, these man-made rules, like the law of Moses, they were a shadow of what the real thing is that was coming. To the Galatians, Paul wrote, So the law was our guardian until Christ came, that we might be justified by faith. Now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. In other words, we need to be, we need to be careful of how we identify ourselves externally as Christians because those don't make us a, Christians, it, a Christian. It is faith in Jesus alone. Now, the shadow image might also be a part of the pagan philosophy that's all mixed in there, uh, but we'll go on from there. Other pagan elements in verse 18, asceticism, we'll talk about that in a minute, treating the body harshly, the worship of angel, and bragging about visions. Those who make up these non-essential markers, well, you have to look like me, you have to talk like me, you have to do this, wear this, these are the things that you have to do to be a Christian, like be a Patriots fan. What? No. It's faith in God. And what maddens Paul the most is the arrogance of judging others who do not do the things these people do. That's false hum humility and pride of saying, I know the best way to be a Christ follower. You've got to be a Patriots fan, watch sumo, and about, you know, you got the idea. It's just like, what? It's faith in Jesus alone. If you insist on making man-made rules, then you're cutting yourself off from the head, Christ. You're like a chicken with its head cut off. You're diluting the message of faith so that it is no longer the good news, but a blend of paganism and Judaism. Now, Paul has used up a lot of ink, encouraging them to stay connected to Jesus, to identify with him, to stay firm, to identify with Christ. It's like what he wrote for to the church at Galatia. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourself be burdened again with the yoke of slavery. Now in chapter 3 we'll look at, there are some identity markers that we have as Christians, but they're not external. I'll give you one for example. All men will, will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. That's an identity marker for being a Christ follower. We'll see that in chapter 3 when we get to it. Next, Paul looks at asceticism. This is the, the don'ts section. So Colossians 2, verse 20. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. Anybody ever, else in, growing up in the church ever hear the don'ts? Referring to things that all perish as they are used according to the human precepts and teaching. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body. But they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. So asceticism is dying to um, make it... The, 
Asceticism is basically denying our body's pleasure or nourishment or rest. It's treating the body harshly. And it's likely that this philosophy is part of um, that a philosophy at the time called uh, Gnosticism that believed the body and the earth were evil. And so you have to suppress, suppress, suppress. Now, there's a good side to asceticism, self-discipline or spiritual disciplines like regular Bible reading and prayer, fasting, generosity, following the walking by the Spirit. Those are good things. Uh, but what's not meant by this is, is, is those external things where the body and the world is evil. Uh, for example, it's actually the end of the Christian community. For, I'll just give you some of Gnostic things here. Uh, to avoid sex, marriage would be condemned and there'd be no next generation. Right? Avoid touching other people. Uh, you'd seek isolation and there'd be no community or relational growth. We grow by our interaction together. To avoid gluttony, people would fast to the point of harming their body. To avoid joy or happiness, people would self-torture themselves. But God said that we are the, uh, Pastor Tony opened with, we are God's, our, our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. There, when God created this earth, he said, it is good. You have the picture. To avoid all contamination with these rules, you would have to remove yourself from life itself, and that's just not possible. You remember during the COVID lockdowns, uh, we were told to avoid each other, not to touch doorknobs. I remember going to the grocery store, those little plastic bags in the produce department. Oh, my goodness. You know, I'd go over and see if there's any ice or liquid anywhere to try to get those open. I'd look around. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> What is this? <laughs> it's like, okay, those rules sort of made sense at the time, right? We're trying to avoid getting sick. But these rules are, are they're nothing. Paul's point is that these rules are made by men. It's nothing more than a designer, man-made religion. And the Bible has a lot to say about man-made rules. Isaiah said, these people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship, their worship of me is based merely on human rules they have been taught. And then Jesus, he actually quoted Isaiah when the Pharisees were, were questioning, why don't your disciples ceremonially wash their hands? And Jesus said, hey, that's nothing more than a man-made rule. Is washing your hands good? Yes. Ceremonially before you eat, and is it making it a, a legalistic thing, an identity of, of your faith? No. It's just washing your hands. Man-made rules sound good and appeal to our desire to, to please God and meet with Him as equals. But external actions are not as important as having a heart that pleases God by surrender and dying to ourselves. Paul goes back to the basics, like Vince Lombardi saying, this is a football one year. Paul says to Christ's followers at Colossae, you're dead. You've died to Christ. You've died, excuse me, you've died to your sins like Christ. How, you don't have to worry about, about falling into sin. You have died. Since you have died with Christ to the elemental forces, spiritual forces of this world. We identify with Jesus in his death. A few verses earlier, he talks about the baptism we had. We died. We are dead that is true. We have been raised to new life. There is something in us that wants to do things to earn God's favor. But all we can do is surrender, die to ourselves, and then live by faith. Now, we live in an age of designer religions out there. Everybody's got their ideas, and they want to sell you something. Believe me. But no man-made rule Religious practices or human intellect will ever earn God's favor. I'm all for being disciplined, but we must not earn or think we earn our salvation by doing works. Let's pause right there. Uh, I want, I'm taking about five to six minutes every Sunday to go over how to talk to our non-Christian friends in the marketplace. And today we're going to just spend a few minutes talking about hell. 
And just a reminder, the, the reason we're doing this is because in Colossians, he, he tells them that we are to, number one, live wisely among those who are not believers. We are to model, our lives are to model and reflect what it means to be a Christian. And so he's walking a fine line here. Because they are to, sh to show markers of being a Christian. That is, uh, we'll get to that in a few weeks. But uh, number two, we are to make the most of every opportunity. And three, we're to let our conversation be gracious and attractive. In other words, <clears throat> I'm giving you some insights how to talk to your friends, not so that you can take your Bible and beat them over the ha head with like a hammer, but how to be gracious and kind and attractional. You know, there are salesmen that are just attractional people and you want to buy something from them. We're to be that type of a person. Well, the question we'll start with is, how can a loving God send people to hell? Mm. This is Christianity's most offensive doctrine to our neighbors. It assumes several things. It assumes, number one, that God's love can be disconnected from justice disconnected from justice. In other words, there's two separate boxes. There's love and there's justice. And love is a great big box. And justice is this little teeny tiny box over here. And we'll just put it off to the side. Number two, it means people are unequal in dignity and worth. In other words, some people are worth saving and others are not. Again, these are misconceptions that they have. Number three, human reasoning about justice is better than God's revelation of the boundaries and consequences. Human reasoning. In other words, we're better judges than God, and so we know better. Why? How could God ever send anybody to hell? And number four, there's nothing after death. Okay, so how do we respond when somebody says, well, a loving God wouldn't send anybody to hell? Well, just here, here's some real, there's three of them. Two of them are pretty much alike. The first two are pretty much alike. God is a God of love and justice. You cannot force anyone to love. God can't force anybody to love him. And forced love is a contradiction in terms. Forced love is not love. And so love, and then number two, you can't have love without justice. In other words, a good God, a loving God, must punish evil without hell Justice would never overtake all the evil and the evil actions done to people. We have a, a former Assembly of God uh, scholar that is actually a, a, a scholar at Yale Divinity School. He was raised in Bosnia and um, he survived the Bosnia War. And he believes that violence occurs when men really don't believe in God. He says... Men don't, don't believe in God and they see an injustice and they say, I will take up the sword and make it right. The Bible says, do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's will. Number three, individuals choose hell. God doesn't send anybody there. He chooses them. I like the C.S. Lewis. I, get, I give you a bunch of scripture verses, but you'll, you'll get the gist of it here. There's a... Uh, Two ways, there's two types of people in the world, according to C.S. Lewis. Those who go like this and says, Lord, your will be done. And then the other person is where to God, God says to them, okay, your will be done. In other words, people make the choice as to what they're going to do. Now, I want to pause and, and look at something here. I've been researching this and trying to get it down in a simple fashion for you. So um, I want to look at how the a couple different worldviews here. And I want you to see that, that the world we live in is not any different than ancient paganism. And now, obviously, our friends, our scientists, our people we work with, they're not out there doing animal sacrifice and dancing under the moon naked or whatever. But the ideas behind it are very, very similar. So I want you to see the differences with, uh, with this. Uh, this... These are the, the beliefs of paganism and modern secularism. This world and universe is all there is. The paganisms believe that even the little gods, you know, these little demigods, they were all part of creation. They were trapped in creation like us. And here our friends believe that science is all there is. 
But as Christians, we believe in an unseen, supernatural dimension. Heaven has been separated from creation because of sin. Number two, humans are just a small part of the whole and are of little value. Little value. Paganism see humanity as just an accident of the gods. The gods were having sex and out came human beings. Secularists believe that and it was an accident of chemistry and time, evolution. And when we die, that's all there is. The pagans offered children in sacrifice to manipulate the gods. The secularists offer abortion to deal with the consequences of sexual liberty. But as Christians, we believe individuals are specifically made and created in God's image for eternal purposes. We are not an accident. God has a plan. Uh, secularists believe that humans are victims of powerful forces. Uh, the pagans believe these small gods, and the secularists believe nature, and no one is responsible for their actions. However, we as Christians believe that we are the problem. Sin in the human heart is the problem, and we are responsible for our action. You see the differences in how we view the world? Number four, hum humanity's struggle is to control one's personal destiny personal destiny, and overcome these powerful forces. Um, the pagans, they would uh, try to manipulate the god by an, gods by, small g, by animal sacrifice or sex or whatever. And uh, the secularists, they, they try to, to control their destiny by pleasure, ambitions. But as Christians, we believe that there, God gave us free will, but we also believe that God has a plan and that ultimately God is in control. Number five, indulgence of sec sexual appetite. Pagans, uh, it was a part of pagan. They'd use sex for worship and to manipulate the gods. Secularists use it for identity and plain old greed, sexual greed. Whereas Christians, we believe that God created sex for procreation and pleasure within boundaries. Boundaries. Now, I want you to see that I'm giving you this insight here um, because the evil one has been around a long time and he seeks to destroy or dilute or cause doubt in your faith. I just took a few minutes to show you the ancient pagan worldview. If you were to carefully examine all the world religions, all the pagan re religions of the world, they would look very much alike. I want you to think back to what it might have been like to live during the time of the Old Testament. Everyone around you is, is pagan. You've got hundreds of different religions, and they're all basically the same, trying to create and, or control, control nature and trying to control things. Humanity kind of like shaking its fist at God, saying, I'm in control here. Into that world... Judaism erupted. Do you see how different Christianity, the Judeo-Christian worldview, is from the pagan worldview? It can only be explained by one thing. God revealed himself to the ancient believers. God revealed himself to Abraham. God revealed himself to Moses. God revealed himself to the prophets. And Israel began to be a light shining in the darkness of the pagan world. In the same way, you and I as believers are a light shining in the pagan world. Today's secularism is very much like the ancients. But you know what? Paul says there's only one way. There's only one way to meet with God and follow Jesus' example. Friends, the, the, the world out there thinks they're in control. They think they've got all the answers. They think they've got it figured out, but they're no different from the ancients who were doing silly things. We need to just die to ourselves and let Christ live through us. Paul wrote to the Galatians, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. To Colossae he wrote, your whole self ruled by flesh was put off when you were circumcised by Christ. 
having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Look at how these two passages are alike. We are to die to ourself. We're to, we're to be resurrected in new life in Christ. And we're to live by faith. These, yes, we'll look at in a couple weeks in chat, when we get to chapter 3, we'll see that there are identity markers for being a Christian. We're to love one another. We're to, there are identity markers, but they're not external markers like what Paul was dealing with. The point of today's message is to keep the main thing the main thing, to not be sucked into those old ways of living. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, it's so easy to slip back into good things, good things that ultimately are not good. Oh, Lord, these externals, Lord, forgive us for being so, so human. Lord, help my friends to be discerning of heart and to have a full passion for following you. And Lord, help each one of us to recognize that we are to die daily, be resurrected, and live our lives passionately following you. Oh, Lord, let your word go down deep into our hearts. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. At this time, we're going to celebrate communion. Connie, I forgot mine. Paul said numerous times in today's passage that we are to identify with Jesus, we're to identify with his death and resurrection. And communion is a symbol of his death, right? And his resurrection. You guys are all fiddling. That's okay. We need to get it over with. I'll say that again. Communion ultimately is a, an identification of the death and resurrection of Jesus, right? We, we, it's a symbol of his, his death and resurrection. So today as we receive communion, I'm going to give it a little slant. Not only are we remembering Jesus' death and resurrection, but we're saying, I am identifying with you by dying to myself and letting your spirit raise me up again. It's not just the historical past of his death and resurrection. It's a present reality of Christ living in us and of us dying to ourselves and letting his spirit live through us. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take and eat, this is my body. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink of it, all of you. This is the blood of my new covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Today we celebrate Jesus' death on our behalf and we remind ourselves of our identification with that death. We died, folks. We're dead. That old is dead. I tell you I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. We also celebrate Jesus' resurrection and the hope we have of our sins forgiven and an abundant life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. Our identity marker is the Holy Spirit living in us. Heavenly Father, <clears throat> Lord, we're going to receive this cup and bread in just a, a second here, but Lord, it's a reminder that you died for our sins and that you rose again in new life and that as we die, as we identify with you in your death, we also identify in your resurrection. Lord, like baptism, we went in the water and we came out of the water new, came out of the grave. That old has died Lord, I pray you keep my friends from being enslaved into the old habits. Lord, some of them are good. Those good, my friend, wanted to lose weight. But Lord, sometimes they can enslave us 
and keep others from the kingdom. Help us to keep our eyes focused on you and the main thing, the main thing. Lord, we thank you so much for sending Jesus for his death and resurrection. Oh, Lord, we just thank you abundantly for that new life we have, that joy and peace we receive because of what Jesus did. Heavenly Father, we recognize that this is a death and a resurrection, a celebration, a celebration of what you did and what we are doing even now. We truly are your body here on this earth. We have identified with death and resurrection. And Lord, we walk by the Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray for our friends that don't know you out there. Lord, they need a revelation. Lord, even as you revealed yourself to Moses and Abraham and the prophets, in the midst of the dark pagan world, help us to, to respond and to share the revelation that we have received. Help us to be hope bearers in this world. Lord, we now receive these elements with joy and thanksgiving. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's eat together. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your grace, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus.